Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday's Word. I'm glad you tuned in and pray that uh, today's devotional be a blessing to you and uh, bless you where you are in your walk today. Uh, we're continuing in the series Love in Action as we look at 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, this is our third part in that series. We're now looking at those 15 characteristics of love that are described in that chapter. As we mentioned before, the first two tell what love does. The, last, the next eight mention what love does not do. And then the last five mention again what love does. Um, in our mind, we can say that we love others. Uh, we love our spouse. We love our parents. We love others. But we've got to look at these characteristics to really know what God's definition of love is and how love behaves and how love is in action. Uh, we've mentioned before that it's not so much a feeling, it can generate feelings, but love is that verb, that action, that uh, in, in our will decides to, to do these particular things. Each time that we've begun, uh, we've looked at uh, when these childhood experts uh, interviewed some four to eight-year-olds and asked them, uh, what does love mean to you? And here are some of those uh, responses. We've read a few each time. This is Tommy, age six. Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. <laughs> well, that's a good one. Uh, that preach right there uh, because when we love each, know each other more, we find more faults, but we still love each other. That's pretty wise on behalf of Tommy, age six. Elaine, age five. Love is when my mommy gives my daddy the best piece of chicken. Chris, age seven. Love is when my mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he's handsomer than Robert Redford. Uh, Marianne, age four, is love is when your puppy licks your face even after you've left him alone all day. You know, there's a lot of wisdom in those answers because they all have to do with selflessness and uh, thinking of others before we think of ourselves and sacrifice. Those are all key ingredients. So these kids hit it, I think, better than many adults would. Um, we're in verse 4. So if you have your Bibles uh, in 1 Corinthians and we continue in verse 4, as we've already mentioned, uh, love is patient and love is kind. Now we're looking at the knots and so love is not jealous. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the difference between jealousy and envy. Matter of fact, a lot of people use them synonymously. Matter of fact, in many different versions of the Bible, uh, one says um, is not jealous, one says envieth not, one says never is jealous nor boils over with jealousy, uh, one says never jealous or envious. And so, uh, they're pretty similar. You know, I believe jealousy has to do more with relationships, but we won't dissect those too much. Uh, but we want to get into that, how powerful and how destructive jealousy can be in any kind of relationship. Uh, you know, I've often thought that even, you know, I've seen relationships destroyed over jealousy. I've seen uh, homes destroyed. Uh, you see countries, I believe some countries go to war with other countries. I believe over a stem of jealousy because they see how one country has more or better or a better lifestyle and they, they don't like, either they don't want those people to have it and they want to have it or they just don't want those people to have it. And so there's so many various forms of jealousy and so many different aspects of the destruction of jealousy. Uh, listen to Proverbs 27, four. Wrath is fierce. And anger is a flood, but who can stand before jealousy? You know, he's almost comparing him that wrath's bad. You know, it's, it, it, wrath is fierce and anger is a flood. And those are two bad things. But he's even saying in comparison, who can stand uh, with jealousy or before jealousy, that that's even worse. Uh, and you can see the devastation that jealousy is done in various people's lives. I mean, think about it. When Saul was jealous over David, remember all the women were 
saying, you know, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. You know, boy, that didn't help Saul's ego. He was jealous over uh, David. And look how that went. All the things that happened where he was trying to take Saul's life, uh, David's life, and all the devastation that came uh, over the beginning of that, I believe, jealousy. I think that was what fueled Saul's rage. Look at all the devastation that had over Joseph's brothers that were jealous over him. I mean, he was getting all the attention. He got the coat of many colors. And I believe jealousy led to their rage uh, against him, even selling him into slavery. You know, the prodigal brother, you know, I believe he was jealous over the, his brother, the prodigal son that we referred to. I mean, he came back home. He got a fatty calf. He got all these got a party or a feast and you know he was comparing what he did with you know he'd been a better brother and he didn't get a party and I think he was just jealous over the attention that his brother was given you know even the Pharisees turning Jesus over had to do with jealousy listen to Matthew 27 18 for he knew that's he Jesus that because of envy they had handed him over because of envy, they handed him over. You know, I think he was getting more attention uh, than they, they thought he should and that they weren't getting. And so that envy led to that. You know, you think of the, those two prostitutes that came to Solomon. I'm not going to go over the whole story. You know, that the one was, you know, saying that her, her the other prostitute's uh, baby died and she took her baby and it got on and on, you know, about, and Solomon was able to find out the truth, you know, through a little different means. And uh, remember he said, well, let's just uh, cut that living baby, the, the one of the two prostitutes that had the living baby, let's just cut that baby in two and give half to one mother and half the other. And the one uh, mother said, no, 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 let her have it. And then the other woman who had brought the case said, no, cut it in two. And he knew which one was the mother because no mother would ever want that for their child and awarded it to the correct mom. But just think about that other woman to have jealousy and envy that she had a living baby, her baby had died, and, and to envy so much, to be jealous so much that you'd want a baby killed just so they wouldn't have one because you don't have one. Uh, you can see that. You know, uh, another one was when Jesus gave that... Uh, parable of the different workers that came at different times of the day. We won't go into all the detail. Remember, some came at the beginning of the day, and some came a little later and a little later, and some came later and later, and some came just, just about an hour before closing time. And they had all agreed for the, uh, the same amount of money uh, was what the owner agreed to, and they agreed to work for that amount. Well, when they started paying all the workers, he paid the ones who showed up last first, and they must have bragged about or said something about what they got because the ones who started early in the day heard what they got, and they said, well, Denarius, I mean, if they got that, I'll get even more. And they got what they were promised, and they were upset that they got the same amount of money as the people that had only worked a short period of time. They worked all day. These people had only worked an hour or so. And he told them this when he said, he said, uh, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own, or is your eye envious because I'm generous? <laughs> You're just envious. You're not getting any less than what I told you. They're just getting more than what you thought they deserved. But they were upset, not because they didn't get what was promised to them, that somebody else got more than what they thought they deserved. Jealousy, envy, the envious eye. That's not love. You know, that's not love for other people. You know, it, it said once that for one man who sincerely pities our misfortunes, there are a thousand who sincerely hate our successes. <laughs> I don't know who said that, but that's so true. In other words, is it easy for you to be happy with somebody's successes? Or does it stir jealousy and envy? Love would not be jealous. It would be happy when somebody else prospers. It would be happy when somebody else gets something maybe that you wanted and you didn't get, but you're happy that they got it. 
That's a challenge in it, but that's love. Love can overcome jealousy and be happy for another person and what they have and what give, God gives them instead of maybe something that we didn't get for ourselves. Can you be happy for others? Can you love others that way? You can because if we truly love, love is not jealous. And then the next one in verse 4 said, Love does not brag. Love does not brag. It doesn't, it's not boastful. You know, it's not braggadocious. And well, think of the society that we live in. It's such a bragging society. Everybody's saying and bragging about who they are and, and what they do and what they've accomplished and maybe where they've been and, and all these. You know, there was a com comedian I saw one time. He was kind of making a little comedy act of that, that, you know, you go to a party and Somebody said, well, I went here on vacation. Others said, well, you know, hey, that's nothing. I went here. Somebody said, well, no, that's nothing. He said, can you imagine that you were an astronaut in that little circle? And then you make the last comment and said, well, you know, I've walked, you know, I walked on the moon. <laughs> Nobody else could top that one, could they? Uh, nobody else could say, well, I've got something better than that. You know, they, they couldn't top that one. And it was kind of a joke he made that, you know, each person, and just think of the statement when somebody has said that. When somebody makes a statement, somebody else, well, that's nothing. Have you ever heard that? They say, well, that's nothing. Then they want to say what they've done. What do you mean that's nothing? That what the person just said? Yeah, that's how anti-love goes. It, it's not concerned about what that person did. People want to top what they did. They want to brag about something of their life which would top what somebody's done in their life. Because that's that temptation. But love doesn't do that. It doesn't want to make somebody, uh, oh, it doesn't want to praise ourselves more than somebody else. Listen to Proverbs 27 2. Let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. It's saying, let somebody else praise you, not yourself. And that doesn't mean go to somebody and say, hey, would you say this in a party about me? <laughs> no. It's just saying, out of somebody else's heart, let them. You say, well, nobody else is praising me. Well, just don't praise yourself. Let somebody else do it. Why? Because love does not brag. It's not braggadocious. It, it looks to really brag on other people. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. You see, knowledge, we can get puffed up at who he is, but love doesn't do that. It edifies other people. It builds up other people. It seeks to, and, and sometimes it can be false, you know, humility. We can kind of do it spiritually. You know, you've heard the joke of the uh, pastor and his associate went to the altar at the church just there was nobody else there and they they prayed and the pastor said Lord I thank you that I'm just nobody before you and then the associate pastor says Lord I think I'm just a I'm glad I'm just a nobody before you and then the little boy that mowed the yard heard him in there praying that and he kind of made his way in the altar and he knelt beside him to pray and said Lord I, I thank, thank you that I'm just a nobody without you and then the Two pastors looked over at the kid and said, now look who thinks he's a nobody. <laughs> you see, we can spiritualize our humility when it's really just pride, when we're bragging on who we are, or the spirituality that we've obtained. And, and that's really false spirituality because true spirituality and true love does not brag. Just, just think of the disciples. It's just a short time before Jesus goes to the cross. And what are the disciples doing they're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. I mean, you can see them back there. No, I think I'm the greatest. I've done greater things. No, no, I'll be the greatest in the kingdom. They're doing all that discussion while Jesus is just, you know, a short time before going to the cross for them. And that was their focus because temptation leads us that way of, of looking. And, you know, I've, I've, I've read where love doesn't parade itself but it actually seeks to parade others. It, it looks to build up others. It looks to brag on others. It actually seeks that. Is that what you do when you speak? It's like, hey, I want to 
mention what that person did, and I'd like to say what that person did. It's so easy to say what we've done. And I didn't, that doesn't mean that we don't give testimony and that we don't speak of things we've done, but we don't focus on that. It's not to brag. <laughs> it may, if we seek anything, we want to brag on the Lord, but we want to parade others. We want to brag on other people. That's our focus is others. You know, it's said that two of the most well-known leaders in Great Britain were William Gladstone and Benjamin Disraeli. Those, those were both prime ministers of, uh, of England. And a matter of fact, uh, we, William Gladstone had uh, been prime minister on four different times, and Benjamin Dis Disraeli uh, served two times as prime minister. And these men were, were great men, great leaders, and uh, did accomplished uh, great things for England. But they had two opposites approaches in dealing with people. Uh, and it's illustrated by a woman that said that she was uh, actually had the honor to meet both those prime ministers on two consecutive uh, days that she was able to meet them. And they said, well, what was your impression of those two leaders? Here's what she said. When I left the dining room after sitting next to Mr. Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in all of England. But after sitting next to Mr. Disraeli, I thought I was the cleverest woman in all of England. Been around those people? Or one, you're impressed with them when you leave. And with others, you feel better about yourself and you, you feel like you're a better person because of how they bragged on you and their focus wasn't bragging on themselves. You see, love does not brag on itself. It focuses on others. And so with those two that we've learned, let's continue to learn how to love better. Love's not jealous and it doesn't it doesn't boast, it doesn't brag on itself. It seeks to lift up and build up other people. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for leaving us these words, Lord, that help us to love better and to see really what love entails and what love is and the characteristics of love. So Father, help us to implement these practically in our life so that we can love others that you put in our path the way that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, just wanted to finish up with just a couple of things. Uh, last Sunday was our regather and it was a great turnout. It was a great um, service. It was just a great spirit in the auditorium there and then in the church as we just, you know, got to see people and fellowship and hear the word and worship. It was just a, a great time. And we hope uh, you, if you weren't able to make that and you're in good health, come on this Sunday. We're going to, we're going to have the Lord's Supper this Sunday. Um, it's a time that we can have this memorial meal in remembrance of Christ, that we can enjoy this together. And yes, we're not going to uh, serve it the normal way where we pass out the elements. Uh, we've got these little uh, self-contained cups that each person will be able to get their own cup and uh, for them and their family. Uh, and you just peel it off, and then there's the, uh, the bread, uh, the cracker. And then when you peel off the second layer, then that opens it up the place for the juice. And so it'll be uh, self-contained that way. So people that are concerned about different people touching different things. You don't have to worry about that. We've made those arrangements and uh, be easy to pick up for your family and you don't have to be concerned about that. So don't miss the Lord's Supper this Sunday. It'll be a great time together uh, to be able to enjoy the communion. Uh, that's uh, just one of the two ordinances for the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, it's always a great time as we remember what Christ did for us. Uh, a time of remembrance. And uh, I don't know about you, just those Lord's Supper times are just great moments that uh, we have together as a church family and, and uh, thinking of Christ and remembering him. So anyway, just wanted to let you know that. Um, I love you. We love you as a church together. It's just praising the Lord that we're all one body and we're so united. I pray for you and look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.